So, hi, I'm Alan Summers. Uh, I live in uh, Longmont, Colorado. I've been working on FreeBSD since 2011, ever since Justin Gibbs hired me. Hi, Justin. And for the last five years, I've been working for a company called Axient, uh, which does a, a backup and disaster recovery, a cloud-based program. And I'm going to talk to you about um, how we use FreeBSD, what advantages it gives us, what it means to us, and what problems it has. So, first, about our company. We sell uh, a variety of products, but they all can basically be generalized as backup and disaster recovery. A medium-sized business has 100 laptops. They all back up to our cloud, um, and they would store when they want. Remember those hurricanes that hit Florida a couple of weeks ago? Um, uh, some of our Florida-based customers were able to restore their servers as soon as the hurricanes get, and based on their backups, we restored them into um, a virtualized cloud server so their businesses had no interruption. All of these products, our various different backup products, store all of their data on FreeBSD. Once upon a time, we used uh, Oracle Solaris 11 to do this. Uh, it's okay, I'm in therapy. But we converted everything to FreeBSD storage uh, about five years ago. Um, so, um, how do we actually store it? Here, uh, here's the simplified version of our software stack. You're probably familiar with all of these components. We use both NVMe disks and SAS. Uh, we multipath our SAS for high availability. Most of our servers have a lot of disks, like 100 SAS disks, 100 to 400 SAS disks. We encrypt everything, both at the customer level, but also uh, with Jelly at the disk level. There are regulatory requirements for storing things like health data, and using full disk encryption makes it very easy to satisfy those regulatory requirements. So we encrypt everything, usually twice. The data is all stored in ZFS, and I am sure you all know plenty about ZFS, so I'm not gonna talk about that. We serve some of it over NFS for some products, some of it over iSCSI for some products. We use a little bit of Fuse, not terribly interesting ways, if you've noticed that I've committed a lot of stuff related to Fuse, that's actually mostly not related to work. Um, when we're not using NFS or iSCSI, uh, most of our products actually run directly on the storage. I'm not gonna uh, get into all the proprietary apps we have, except for one, I'm saving that one for the end. Uh, other features that are important to us, and we're glad that FreeBSD provides them, includes the PF firewall, uh, the audit security framework, um, lag for LACP that gives us redundant networking, um, as well as the LLDPD daemon from ports. I'm very grateful somebody introduced that to me. It makes it very easy to debug LACP problems. We use VLANs, we use DevD, that's especially useful in combination with uh, GMultipath. We use ZFSD to uh, automatically prepare our ZFS pools. We use the CES driver um, to uh, both uh, determine the state of our SAS hard disks as well as to illuminate the little error light that the technician can use to find the broken ones. We use jails. We use them for both transitory and persistent purposes. Uh, currently using IOCage to manage the persistent ones. We do monitoring with Zabbix and Prometheus, configuration management with SALT, uh, DNS. We use ZREPL to uh, uh, replicate ZFS data sets over long distances. These are all imports. Uh, LDAP for user accounts and NSCD for uh, caching names. Um, believe it or not, we still use INETD. That was uh, invented back in the days when it was too expensive to have a single server doing nothing but listening to a socket, but it's still useful in this era. Um, to build our images, um, See, I think uh, Ian yesterday at Medix was talking about building full images that you can uh, write to a hard drive. That's actually not what we choose to do because upgrading uh, in a case like that, even when you um, only want to change a user land component, does require a reboot. Because we're concerned more about downtime, we use FreeBSD update build and FreeBSD Rust date to uh, install our, all of our updates just like a desktop user would use, except we have to build everything ourselves. 
And I want to mention that just a couple of months ago, FreeBSD Rust date appeared in ports. It's like 100 times faster than FreeBSD update. It's great. Um, also, as Ian from Bedex mentioned, we use Prometheus for monitoring, for real-time monitoring of um, all of our performance and uh, uh, you know, error uh, conditions. It's easily available in ports, and there's quite a few uh, off-the-shelf exporters for it, all in ports. You can get um, you know, CPU load, uptime, um, uh, network throughput, sysctls are all in the base system. It's also very easy to write your own Prometheus exporters. So we've done that. We've written our own exporters to get data from NFS, from iSCSI, from libzfs, ZTOP, and a couple of proprietary things too. And several of those are now in the ports tree for everyone to use. Working at a storage company, disk failures are an everyday occurrence. So we've had to get really good at automating our disk replacement process. Basically, it goes like this. We start with a healthy pool, and then if a disk generates too many I.O. errors or slows down or disappears entirely, ZFSD will automatically fault it. Then Prometheus will pick up the fault condition and alert uh, us engineers. Or we also install SmartMon tools from ports. And once a day, we run SmartMon's periodic job, which checks uh, every disk's uh, reliability info. Any disk that has uh, a predicted failure will generate an email that sends to us engineers. And then if we agree with the prediction, we run a script on the server to fault the disk. This is the only real manual part of the process. <clears throat> on the server, we, um, we, we uh, uh, run zinject. It's actually a Python script that uses libzfs, but it does the same thing as zinject does. And turn on the fault LEDs in CES. <clears throat> and uh, it also generates a JIRA ticket for the uh, technician to read. As soon as the disk is faulted, ZFSD also picks it up and uh, activates a hot spare. So ZFS begins resilvering a hot spare right away. So we um, uh, minimize the amount of time we have with, with reduced redundancy. The technician usually arrives um, within a day or two and replaces the originally failed disk. DevD observes that problem and calls a custom script of ours which writes a new G multipath label and then on top of that, a new Jelly encryption label. As soon as the Jelly device appears, ZFSD picks that up and replaces the originally failed disk with a new one, starts resilvering again, oftentimes even before the hot spare has finished resilvering. As soon as the uh, replacement disk is healthy, ZFSD ejects the hot spare and we're back to an original healthy pool. Um, and of all these components, um, the only part that's closed source is that custom script that runs zinject. Everything else can be set up on any FreeBSD system. Oh, and the G multipath label, but most people don't need G multipath. So now I want to give you uh, an example of how FreeBSD let us update an old legacy application. I mentioned that we were running on Solaris 11. Uh, one of the applications we had on Solaris 11 hadn't been updated very much since you know 2010 or so. It had a number of problems. In addition to being built for Solaris, it uh, required an old version of OpenSSL, an obsolete version, and it statically linked to it. It also needed an obsolete version of PostgreSQL client, and it also statically linked to that. Even worse, it couldn't use the vanilla PostgreSQL client. It had a custom patch in there just to um, change the SIG pipe handling. And it could only use TLS version 1.0. I'm hearing laughs. Not 1.0 or later, it was hard coded to use TLS 1.0, which had known security vulnerabilities at this point. So how do we port this application and how do we update it? Uh, it was remarkably easy thanks to jails, ports, and Git. First of all, we had to get a PostgreSQL client that could build and that could work with this program. But the port history is all in Git, and ports is all a source-based um, uh, package system, so we could easily uh, pull the old PostgreSQL client out of Git. It didn't build on what was in current FreeBSD 12, but that's no problem. Um, we also didn't have OpenSSL uh, 0.9.8 in FreeBSD 12, but those things both worked in FreeBSD 9, so jails to the rescue. 
IOCage made it easy to install a FreeBSD jail running FreeBSD 9. And once we had that, we have the right ancient version of OpenSSL, and PostgreSQL can build again. So we built the entire application in FreeBSD 9 and did all the miscellaneous little uh, uh, fixes you need whenever you port to an operating system. Now, having a working program, we could get rid of that pesky custom SIG pipe patch because FreeBSD supports the SO no SIG pipe socket option, which does just what we want. So we teach the main binary how to use no SIG pipe, and then we can eliminate the PostgreSQL patch and once again run with vanilla PostgreSQL. Then we needed to get a uh, currently supported version of PostgreSQL and OpenSSL. So we just kind of walked up the version tree, updating one then the other and updating the jail until we got to 11. Everything was still supported then, so we were able to deploy on FreeBSD 11. FreeBSD 11 jails, that is, on a FreeBSD 12 host. So between jails, ports, and Git, we were able to take a big problem and make it into a lot of little small problems, greatly easing the maintenance of this legacy application. Next problem. We had a new business requirement. Some customers want to restore their data using uh, FTP. FTP over TLS for security. <coughs> That's fine, but all of our servers are multi-tenant. Uh, lots of customers may host their data on a single server, and we don't want any cross-tenant access. How do we ensure that uh, one customer using an FTP restore cannot get another's data? The most obvious way to do that is just to rely on access validation all within the server process. That's you know what most software does. Um, you know, uh, custom web servers or every single off-the-shelf FTP server that there is already, every single one imports does this. But the problem is that the attack surface is far too large. If there's an attacker, the potential attack surface is the entire program. A bug anywhere in the program might potentially enable an attacker to get hold of data they can't, they shouldn't be able to access. And we can't ensure that there isn't a bug anywhere in the program, especially because we're not even writing the FTP server from scratch. We're going to choose one off the shelf. So the next obvious <coughs> solution is to use this wonderful feature I've already described called jails. Can we jail the server process? Jail it to within just the home directory of one user. That would uh, neatly prevent any cross-tenant access, but it comes with another problem. There would be way too many jails, way too many customers. We can't statically create one jail for every customer. That would be too many jails for one server. So we have to do them dynamically. Create a new jail every time a new customer connects and tear it down when they're done. That uh, would require lots of configuration. It would be very complicated. It might solve the security problem, but we're probably bringing in new bugs. But there's a third option to use Capsicum. Um, let's see a show of hands. How many people are familiar with the basic principle of Capsicum? Okay, that's most of us. Uh, to summarize it for the rest of you, Capsicum is awesome. It's basically a way to jail a single process, <coughs> to reduce the privileges that one process has so that it has access to no global namespaces, no global file system, uh, uh, no global IP address space, no global sysctls, no nothing. Instead, you can delegate to that process only the capabilities it needs when it starts, and it can never gain capabilities after that. And yet, what really makes Capsicum awesome is that all of this is done with zero configuration on the part of the system administrator. It's not like SE Linux or like mandatory access control where you're essentially writing a, uh, a firewall for your file system. Instead, all of the logic is embedded by the programmer into the application, and it uh, reduces privileges automatically with no input from the system administrator. That's what we chose. It's configuration free. Once, we, um, once you program Capsicum into an application, there's nothing the system administrator needs to do. And um, all, those, all that privilege isolation is enforced in the kernel, and it's the same for every process, so the uh, uh, the attack surface is much smaller than the entire server application. Um, 
and getting better, as I believe um, Alice just talked about regarding synactives at it. Thank you for that. So how do you capsicumize an FTP server? First of all, FTP is kind of weird. It's actually older than TCP, and so the protocol does some unusual things, like it creates multiple sockets, and it creates them in a bi-directional fashion. So the first thing we have to do is just disable active FTP mode. That's okay, because almost every client supports the newer passive mode anyway, because it works better with firewalls. So our server only does passive mode. The second thing that you have to do when capsicumizing any application is to do all your initialization a lot earlier. Allocation, opening files, especially in our case, opening TLS certificates, all that needs to be done earlier, that's easy. The third task is usually the most involved for any application. You can never use the open syscall. Instead, you have to use open at. That works um, based on using an existing directory file scripter to open a file in a uh, child directory of the initial descriptor. And that's, um, that descriptor is also known in Capsicum speak as a capability. And that's how Capsicum can keep access to a subset of your entire file system. You open the directory when the program initializes and drop, and then when you enter Capsicum mode, you drop privilege to the entire rest of the file system but retain that capability. Uh, in our case, using OpenAt was actually straightforward. There were no hard problems to convert the file server to use that. Um, the fourth obvious change we have to make is that we have to fork a separate process for every connection because Capsicum applies at the level of the entire process. So if you want a server that serves multiple users, they've each got to have their own process. This is not too weird. It's what Apache has long done for serving websites. <coughs> Uh, even though it's not perhaps the most performant option for, um, for web servers these days, it's easy to fork a new process for every user. Fifth, and this one is less obvious, it is not sufficient to fork a new process because KQ is never inherited on fork, and our listening process uses KQ. So we actually need to exec a new executable just so we can open a new KQ. We exec after we fork. Um, next, we need to use Casper in order to make bind work. I said that a, a capsicumized process has no access to global namespaces. Well, that's the ideal, but occasionally you need to do things anyway. In an FTP server, for example, uh, you typically can only use certain ports for the data connection. Those are configured by the system administrator. But bind is a syscall that uses a global namespace. So how can you call that from Capsicum? That works by using libcasper, which was written by our colleague Pavel, who's back there somewhere. Hi, Pavel, wherever you are. There he is. <laughs> Casper works by creating a separate child process uh, right when your Capsicum process enters, uh, starts, but before it enters Capsicum mode. The child process itself never enters capability mode and it communicates with the parent over a Unix domain socket using a well-defined interface. So the child process has permission to do things like, in this case, call bind. When the parent's parent process needs to bind a socket, it uh, instantiates a socket and then passes the socket over the, the, um, over the uh, Unix domain socket to Casper. Casper binds it and then passes it back. The interface that goes over that Unix domain socket is very small and is easy to audit, so that keeps the attack surface small. It, um, it gives you the security advantages of Capsicum while allowing you to use the occasional global namespace like bind. Uh, finally, um, I mentioned we have to port fork for uh, every, um, every connection. The FTP server you, we used was originally multi-threaded but since we're forking all the time anyway, we switched it to work in single-threaded mode. Both the listening process works in single-threading mode, and now the worker processes are single-threaded too because we've got a lot of parallel connections, so why not? The FTP server we chose to use is called libunftp. Um, it was written by Bolcom, which is an e-commerce company in the Netherlands, and it's open source. 
You may be asking why we didn't use the one that's built into our operating system already. And that's because it doesn't have TLS support. And uh, it was easier to go out and use this third-party uh, FTP server that already had TLS support. It's on GitHub. You can download it. Our specific program called capbind is actually closed source. But the binary only contains boring code. It's got stuff like our details for user authentication. All of the interesting changes that I've talked about here are part of the library. And in fact, the library includes a fully functional FTP server as an example that you can download if you want to um, base it, uh, make an application based on it for your needs. Uh, and finally, I'd like to mention the things that FreeBSD doesn't have that we do wish it would have, and some of which maybe we could do someday if we have the time. Top of my wish list is probably to integrate CES with ZFSD. CES is really important to us as a way to, for the engineers to communicate to the technicians, but right now we've got, um, we have to use a separate set of scripts to just to activate that disk's fault LED. ZFSD is really the right place to do that because it's, it knows which disks need replacing at any given time. If we could integrate those, that would, uh, that would improve our workflow and it would help everybody else because as far as I know, everybody who uses CES right now has to re-implement the same stuff over and over. Uh, another uh, great feature that we could have, though it might be a lot of work, would be integrating multipath directly into CAM. CAM actually has all the information it needs to know which two disks belong to the same path. That stuff comes through CES, and CAM has visibility into CES. It just wasn't written with multipath in mind, which is why somebody had to do it in a GEOM. The GEOM module works well enough, but using GEOM requires you to manually write a label to every disk. CAM, if it were aware of multipathing, could do that automatically. No labels required. Another great feature would be ZFS encryption. Though people are already using it, it's kind of notorious for bugs, and we've already heard mention of that um, during this conference. We've experimented with it, but we suffered some data corruption bugs, so we abandoned it and went back to Jelly. If we could use ZFS, ZFS crypto, that would be great because it's fundamentally faster than Jelly. Jelly encrypts data after the parity has been calculated, but ZFS encrypts it before the parity has been calculated. So ZFS has a lot less work to do. Uh, clustered storage is another pain point for us and a lot of users. We've experimented, but um, all of the clustered storage options that are available in and as far as we know outside of ports are just too complicated for the small subset of our business that could actually benefit for them. So we're not actually using any at this point. MooseFS or Ceph seem the likeliest contenders. It'd be great if we could improve that story. KTLS is another great feature. That's uh, one that only appeared in FreeBSD 13.1, I think, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, it would be great when compared when uh, paired with ZFS, uh, ZFS receive, um, and it's also great for things like file servers, like the FTP server that I mentioned. When you pair it with SynFile, so far um, our need hasn't been great enough that we've done that ourselves. We might someday. It would be a great feature to have. Uh, Jelly performance issues, we're heavy users of Jelly, and one problem it has is that it, by default, it creates a thread pool for each disk. Uh, a thread pool with as many threads as you have CPUs. That's great if you have a laptop with a fast NVMe disk, but if you have 400 disks and 24 CPUs, 400 times 24 is an awful lot of threads. Even if you tune it down to just one thread per disk, that's still too many. Um, having a, a global thread pool instead of a per disk thread pool should in theory be a lot faster. I've actually prototyped that, but it's, in some cases it ends up being slower than the status quo and I've never had time to solve uh, all those problems. It'd be great if we could do it someday. The final problem I want to mention is that K-Event still after all these years doesn't quite work very well in Go. If you try to use K-Event in a multi-threaded Go, pro Go program, it ends up uh, creating multiple K events, and then accessing each one of those from every thread. This creates tons of in-kernel lock contention, and it's actually one of, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest CPU consumers in our entire product, embarrassingly. Even after we've tuned it down, it's still kind of bad. I lack the Go skills to fix it myself. It'd be great if somebody did, sometimes. 
Okay, that's all I have tonight. Um, uh, I think I, I hope I've given you some idea of what value FreeBSD can bring to a business like ours, um, and uh, what advantages it gives us that we can't get anywhere else, and uh, what we get from it. Uh, I'll also, um, I hope I didn't underemphasize what we give back to. We, we uh, don't want to carry a whole stack of changes in our private tree. We're not selling FreeBSD, we're using it. So we try to contribute back every patch as soon as we can. And if there's some feature I've talked about that you're more interested in, um, we probably could release the source if, um, if there's interest in it. For example, getting a Prometheus data from ZTOP. Are there any questions? Pavel. So you, <clears throat> so you did mention that uh, uh, in the disk replacement process, you monitor if the disk is faulty, but also if the disk is slowing down. So I would like to, if you could elaborate how you monitor if the disk is getting slower, because that's a big problem. Pavel asked how we monitor if a disk is too slow. Yeah, yes, okay. <laughs> Your accent is, is Sonorant, Pavel. Um, uh, this is a new feature we added to ZFS, to ZFSD. Um, ZFS, or is it Geom? ZFS will emit an event to user space if a disk takes more than a certain amount of time, well, really a Geom provider takes more than a certain amount of time to complete an operation. And so there's now a rule in ZFSD that will fault any disk that gets too many of these events within a certain time frame, 10 events per minute or something like that. And it's tunable based on VDEV properties. You may also want to talk to Alan Jude, who's working on another feature for detecting slow disks. We have more questions? Ah, good question. The question is, before we used Capsicum with FTPD, did we try the JLS approach, and at what point did it stop scaling? Oh, static JLS. No, no, we, didn't, we never even tried that, because we know we have too many uh, consumers. Um, with FTP, we went straight to Capsicum. I will say with another product, we did use the JLS approach, but we used the dynamic JLS, not, um, not static, not static jails. We create them on each connection. And that's working okay right now. It's just a lot more code. I, I prefer the capsicum approach myself. Michael Dexter. Ah, that's the way we fault to disk, which otherwise ZFS thinks is okay. Z inject was in, is intended as a, a testing tool that you can use to fault a pool to see how ZFS handles that. But if smart CTL predicts that a disk is going to fail, or if the engineer observes that it's too slow or otherwise not working, but in the way that ZFS D doesn't get, we fault it itself to, so that it doesn't slow down the entire pool. That's what Z inject does. Any more? So in your use of Jelly, are you just encrypting the file system, or are you actually encrypting each file? We use Jelly for full disk encryption. So we're, we're encrypting at the disk level beneath the file system. Any more? John. So for the Jelly thread pool thing, we definitely should fix that. Um, I know that there's, some, there's an open PR from some folks there's like an AMD systems or something where they're using ASNI and they get and it's and they have lots of providers and it, 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 they do not like having all the threads. So definitely, I think even if it's in some cases a little worse, it really should not be umpteen bazillion threads. Um, so a global thread pool definitely makes sense. Uh, my other comment is I can now appreciate all the various things you work on because I can kind of see how they're stitched together. Because like many of the things you work on is a wide variety of things across the tree. So it's very interesting to see how they all glue together.
Thank you, John. Pablo again. Pavo asked if AES and I can do direct dispatch, which means that the, uh, the data never needs to get mapped into the memory. It goes directly from user space to the disk. Oh, okay, I mistook. Geom direct dispatch is a different feature then. In, in particular, with an with an open crypto session, um, you can there's a flag you can check to see if your session is async versus sync. Um, and if your session is async, you have, if you have some PCI coprocessor that's going to have to you have to your know, queue request off to it, it's going to deem it and send it your back. That you can't do in G up and G down because you'll block I/O in the system. But if you're using a synchronous you know accelerated software, you could just do that synchronously. I think is what Pavel's suggesting. So when you're getting ready to dispatch. Um, uh, bio and jelly, you can look to see based on my what kind of crypto session I have the flag of, of is it synchronous or async? I can decide do I just call it or do I actually use um, it's even a flag on crypto invoke, right? Uh, no, but I guess instead of punting to a K thread, you just directly crypto dispatch directly inside G up and G down. Does that make sense? John, it's been a couple of years since I looked at that, and my memory's a little rusty. I cannot remember if there's a reason why that was not a possibility. It's not with the PCI case. Because then you, when you have a PCI control processor, right. you're going to have to sleep away from the interrupt. You can't do that in chip and GDAP. But not with AMP and that, because then you're just going to run this program. Right. We don't have a PCI code processor, but maybe the necessity of supporting such devices limits the API? Uh, action item for the future. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I think we're done. Thank you, Alan. <laughs>